Please welcome Dr. Jill Biden. history. Together, we will elect the first woman president of the United States, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Let me start by thanking you for allowing me to serve as second lady of the United States for the past eight years. an honor and let me thank you for the love and support you have given our family it has meant the world to us over the past eight years America has gotten to know the Joe Biden that I know and love he's honest and strong principled and compassionate. He was authentic long before it became a buzzword in politics. He understands that working people are the backbone of this nation. And he has tremendous empathy for those in need. He knows, as I do, that education is the great equalizer and that community colleges are America's best kept secret. And he believes, as I do, that we have a special obligation to our military and their families. He has a deep commitment to justice, and he has spent his whole career standing up to the abuse of power. He knows at its best, politics is always a matter of the heart. And he remains today, even after all he's been through, the most optimistic person I know. He loves his family. He loves this country. He's your Vice President and my husband, Joe Biden. You know, my dad used to have an expression. He said, it's a lucky person gets up in the morning, puts both feet in the floor, knows what they're about to do, and thinks it still matters. For over 40 years, Joe Biden has had the courage to speak out and lead on the toughest issues facing America. When I wrote the Violence Against Women Act back in 1989, I think people, although they cared about it, thought maybe there's not much we can do about it. But he saw an injustice too great to ignore. Violence against women was a moral stain on the conscience of a nation. We created a civil cause of action to empower women who are abused in this country. For millions of women, the Violence Against Women Act has provided protection, support, and the ability to rebuild their lives. Apartheid in South Africa offended everything we stood for as a nation, but America was slow to act. I'm ashamed of the lack of moral backbone to this policy. These Here. people are dying. You feel frustration, they're dying. They're being shot. Of they're course. lined up and they're shooting children. Our loyalty is not to South Africa, it's to South Africans. Genocide in Bosnia challenged the world. Joe Biden spoke out. What's going on is an atrocity. This guy's a thug, a war criminal. It's truly a shame what we're allowing to happen. We're acting collectively as the free world like cowards. 
In the 1990s, the NRA threatened anyone who crossed them. Joe Biden took them on. We will not step back from the commitment we have made to the American people to give them safe streets, safe homes, and safe schools. That's why we fought the gun lobby and passed a ban on assault weapons. It's the kind of courage we need today in Congress to stand up to the NRA. When the freedom to love who you choose was being denied by our own government, Joe Biden said, no more. And what this is all about is a simple proposition. Who do you love? Who do you love? And will you be loyal to the person you love? And that's what people are finding out is what, what all marriages at their root are about. Well, whether they're marriages of lesbians or gay men or heterosexuals. It's over the long constitutional debate on whether gay couples have a constitutional right to marry is over and the answer is yes. For Joe Biden, the one sacred obligation of a nation is to those who have served. The veterans of America are not only the heart and soul, but you are the very spine of this nation who have served and sacrificed for all of us. And for those military families who have lost loved ones, who have sacrificed the most, he's offered hope. There will come a day when the thought of your son or daughter or your husband or wife brings a smile to your lips before it brings a tear to your eye. It will happen. My prayer for you is that day will come sooner or later. But the only thing I have more experience in you in is this. I'm telling you, it will come. I believe we need a moonshot in this country to cure cancer. It's personal. Like many of you, I've experienced in my family a dreaded C word. Every year around the world, 14 million people are diagnosed with cancer. We are going to fundamentally change the face of cancer. And because he's gone to the mat for all of us on so many issues over the past 40 years, I'm putting Joe in charge of mission control. In the last 22 years, violence against women has dropped 64% and more people are reporting. But the one place it hasn't changed is on college campuses. Today, he's leading a movement to end sex abuse on college campuses. Unfortunately, one in five women will be the victim of sexual assault while a student. And that's why we launched the It's On Us campaign. It says, one, I promise to intervene when I see something. Two, I promise to create an environment where sexual assault is unacceptable. And three, no consent means no. A gut-wrenching story that has gone viral. Vice President Joe Biden has written a heartfelt letter to the survivor. I do not know your name, but your words are forever seared in my soul. Your words will help people you have never met. You've given them the strength they need to fight. I do not know your name, but I will never forget you. Let's change the culture so that no abused woman or man ever feel they have to ask themselves, what did I do? They did nothing wrong. It was the great battles over civil rights and the Vietnam War that brought Joe Biden to public life. And he hasn't flinched or walked away from the great battles that have driven and defined this nation ever since. His has been a career defined by honesty, passion, and conviction. And throughout it all, when it mattered most, he's forced us all to look deep in our souls and ask, is this who we are as a nation? And perhaps more importantly, is this who we want to be? I am more optimistic about America's chances today than I have been my entire life. and gentlemen, please welcome the Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden.
execute. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, thank you, thank you. You, I love you. Ladies and gentlemen, eight years ago, I stood on a stage in Denver, and I accepted your nomination to be Vice President of the United States. And every single day since then, it's been the honor of our lives for Jill and me. Every day, we've been grateful to Barack and Michelle for asking them to join us in this and join them in that incredible journey. A journey, a journey that can only happen in America. But we not only have worked together, as it becomes pretty obvious, we become friends. We're now family. We're family. Folks, you've all seen over the last eight years what President Obama means to this country. He's the embodiment. He is the embodiment of honor resolve and character. One of the finest presidents we have ever had. That's right. This is a man of character. And he's become a brother to Jill and me. And Michelle, I don't know where you are, kid, but you're incredible. You are incredible. <laughs> and I was talking to Barack today. It's no longer who's going to give the best speech. We already know who did that. You were incredible Monday night. To the Delaware delegation, as they say in Southern Delaware. Barack and I married way up. <laughs> way up. Folks, as I stand here tonight, <clears throat> I see so many friends and colleagues like my buddy Chris Dodd and the Connecticut delegation. So, so many people here. I see the faces of those who, uh, who have placed their belief in Barack and me. So many faces, but one. This is kind of a bittersweet moment for Jill and me and our family. In 2008, when he was about to deploy to Iraq, and again in 2012, our son Bo introduced me to the country and placed my name in nomination. You got a glimpse. I know I sound like a dad, but you got a glimpse of what an incredibly fine young man Bo was. Thank you. Thank you. His wife, Hallie, and his two kids are here tonight. But as Ernest Hemingway once wrote, the world breaks everyone, and afterwards, many are strong at the broken places. I've been made strong at the broken places by my love, Jill, by my heart, my son, Hunter, and the love of my life, my Ashley, and by all of you, and I mean this sincerely, those of you who've been through this, you know I mean what I say by all of you. Your love, your prayers, your support. But you know what we talk about? 
We think about the countless thousands of other people who suffered so much more than we have with so much less support, so much less reason to go on. But they get up every morning, every day. They put one foot in front of the other. They keep going. That's the unbreakable spirit of the people of America. That's who we are. That's who we are. Don't forget it. Like the people in the neighborhood that Jill and I grew up in, she in Willow Grove and my down in Wilmington and Claymont. The kid in Claymont with the most courage who always jumped in when you were double teamed or your back was against the wall, who became a cop because he always wanted to help people. The middle daughter of three daughters who always made her mother smile, who was a hero to her sisters, now a major in the United States Marine Corps because, Mr. Press President, I wanted to serve my country. The teacher, the teachers who Jill knows and so many of you know, who take money out of their own pockets to buy pencils and notebooks for the students who can't afford them. Why? Why? Because being a teacher is not what they do, it's who they are. You know what I know, for real. These are the people who are the heart and soul of this country. It's the America that I know, the America that Hillary knows and Tim Kaine knows. You know, I've known Hillary for well over 30 years. Before she was First Lady of the United States, when she became First Lady, we served together in the United States Senate. And during her years as Secretary of State, once a week, we had breakfast in my home, the Vice President's residence. Everybody knows she's smart. Everybody knows she's tough, but I know what she's passionate about. I know Hillary. Hillary understands. Hillary gets it. Hillary understands that that college loan is about a lot more than getting a qualified student education. It's about saving the mom and the dad from the indignity of having to look at their talented child and say, Sonny, honey, I'm so sorry. The bank wouldn't lend me the money. I can't help you to get to school. I know that about Hillary. Hillary understood that for years, millions of people went to bed staring at the ceiling, thinking, oh my God, what if I get breast cancer or he has a heart attack? I will lose everything. What will we do then? I know about Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, We all understand what it will mean for our daughters and granddaughters when Hillary Clinton walks into the Oval Office as President of the United States of America. It will change their lives. My daughters and granddaughters can do anything any son or grandson can do. And she will prove it, Mr. Mayor. So let me say as clearly I can, as I can, if you live in the neighborhoods like the one Jill and I grew up in, if you worry about your job and getting a decent pay, if you worry about your children's education, if you're taking care of an elderly parent, then there's only one, only one person in this election who will help you. There's only one person in this race who will be there who's always been there for you. And that's Hillary Clinton's life story. It's not just who she is, it's her life story. She's always there. She's always been there. And so has Tim Kaine.
Ladies and gentlemen, to state the obvious, and I'm not trying to be a wise guy here, I really mean it. That's not Donald Trump's story. Just listen to me a second without booing or cheering. I mean this sincerely. We should really think about this. His cynicism is unbounded. His lack of empathy and compassion can be summed up in a phrase that I suspect he's most proud of having made famous. You're fired. I mean, really, I'm not joking. Think about that. Think about that. Think about everything you learned as a child, no matter where you were raised. How can there be pleasure in saying you're fired? He's trying to tell us he cares about the middle class. Give me a break. That's a bunch of malarkey. I tell you. Whatever, whatever he thinks, whatever he thinks, and I mean this in the bottom of my heart, I know I'm called middle class Joe, in Washington that's not meant as a compliment. It means you're not sophisticated. But I know why we're strong. I know why we have held together. I know why we are united. It's because there's always been a growing middle class. This guy doesn't have a clue about the middle class. Not a clue. Because, folks, when the middle class does well, when the middle class does well, the rich do very well and the poor have hope. They have a way up. He has no clue about what makes America great. Actually, he has no clue, period. But folks, let me, uh, you got it. Let me, Folks, let me, uh, let me say, let me say something that has uh, nothing to do with politics. Let me talk about something that I am deadly serious about. This is a complicated and uncertain world we live in. The threats are too great. The times are too uncertain to elect Donald Trump as president of the United States. Now, let me, let me finish. No major party, no major party nominee in the history of this nation has ever known less or has been less prepared to deal with our national security. We cannot elect a man who exploits our fears of ISIS and other terrorists, who has no plan whatsoever to make us safer. A man who embraces the tactics of our enemies, torture, religious intolerance. You all know, all the Republicans know, that's not who we are. It betrays our values. It alienates those who we need in the fight against ISIS. Donald Trump, with all his rhetoric, would literally make us less safe. We cannot elect a man who belittles our closest allies while embracing dictators like Vladimir Putin. No, I mean it. A man who seeks to sow division in America for his own gain and disorder around the world. A man who confuses bluster with strength. We simply can not let that happen as Americans, period. <laughs> Folks,
I have no one ever no one ever doubts I mean what I say, it's just that sometimes I say all that I mean. <laughs> but folks, let me tell you what I literally tell every world leader I met with, and I've met them all. It's never, never, never been a good bet to bet against America. We have the finest fighting force in the world. Not only. Not. Not only. Not only do we have the largest economy in the world, we have the strongest economy in the world. We have the most productive workers in the world. And given a fair shot, given a fair chance, Americans have never, ever, ever, ever let their country down. Never. Never. Ordinary people like us who do extraordinary things. We've had candidates before who attempted to get elected by appealing to our fears. But they've never succeeded because we do not scare easily. We never bow. We never bend. We never break when confronted with crisis. No, we endure. We overcome. And we always, always, always move forward. That's why. That's why I can say with absolute conviction, I am more optimistic about our chances today than when I was elected as a 29-year-old kid to the Senate. The 21st century is going to be the American century. Because, because we lead not only by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. That is the history of the journey of America. And God willing, God willing, Hillary Clinton will write the next chapter in that journey. We are America, second to none, and we own the finish line. Don't forget it. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Come on. We're America.